great. You've never looked better. <laughs> I kid, I kid. <laughs> <laughs> no, everybody's wearing masks. That's the joke, right? <laughs> you, guys, you guys all have like real professional masks. Well, most of you. Some of you now. Some of you look like absolute ninjas. Right? The, uh, the Clark masks, those are the most ninja-esque of all the masks. <laughs> Well, we already have 11 people waiting online to join in worship. And do we have 11 people here? Yes, I think we do. We have more than 11 people here, right? Yeah, look at that. I can see some of you all the way back there. Now, some of the people saying hello to us online are Maureen Wiersma. Hello, Maureen Wiersma. And there are some waves here. Uh, they weren't to you, Maureen, but they were to people walking in, but I thought for a second they were for you, but I, hi, Maureen. Good to see you. <laughs> I'll wait. Pete Steck is here, along with Deb and Noah and Ryan and Haven. Good morning. Glad you guys are all here. Amen and amen. Glad to worship with you this morning. And hello, Thompson. He knew it. He turned his head when I said his name. That's great. Hello, Thompson. <laughs> I got a smile. The Spears clan is here. Good morning, Brother Steve. Good morning, Christine. Good morning, Caleb. Good morning, Allie. Good morning, Katie. Good morning, Cole. Glad you guys are here. Tyler Rouse. Hola to you too, brother. He, said, he says hola. Hola to everybody. Hola to you, and Deb Cook, Deb Cook, glad you are here with us, good morning to you. So we have five people who've said hello, 15 people on, so for the other 10 people who haven't yet said hello, hello to you, good morning to you, glad you are here, and good morning to people that are here in our presence, Sister Kathy Cossett, good morning, thank you for leading us in the organ this morning. Uh, Angela Puttycomb, thank you for leading us in song this morning. That is a wonderfully bright yellow mask. Looking, looks wonderful. Good morning, Bergsmas, front and center. Glad you guys are here. They got some really nice masks as well, right? But yours, what, yours are hanging down. What's this? Oh, it goes over your head like that? Oh, man, that's, that's good. Don and Gloria Turner say good morning, church. Glad you guys are here. The Rose Bros are here. Chris, Marnie, glad you are here. And uh, Noah, Ryder, and Hudson, we're glad that you are here as well. What's going on? Tim Limes, good morning. Good morning. He says good morning to the pastors. Good morning to the church. And we say good morning to you. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Julia. Glad you are here. Good morning, Aaron. And our brother Josiah Chung is here with us this morning saying hello as well. He visited us last week, so that was uh, a pleasant surprise to have him visit us last week. We were glad to have you, brother. Good morning, Cerizam Ang family. Glad you are here. Kathleen, good morning. London, <laughs> good morning. Theo, good morning. <laughs> Thompson, I said good morning to you, but you're already looking in expectation, right? Good morning, Thompson. Uh, <laughs> and then just behind them, we've got uh, Herbert Hildebrandt. Oh, sorry, Herb Hildebrandt. How you doing, Herb? Pardon? He's smiling. <laughs> Herb Hildebrandt here. He's going to be helping with some of the singing. We're so thankful that you are here with us. Tyson Den Hollander has said good morning. Good morning, Tyson. Good morning, Maureen. Good morning, Harrison. Good morning, Jacobson. Good morning, Jameson. We are so glad that you guys are all here with us. Hello, hello, hello. And then good morning to my ma. Good morning, ma. Glad you are here. And my children. Good morning, children. <laughs> and the birds. Good morning, birds. Getting the thumbs up from the birds. That's good. Awesome. 
The Peening family says hello to everybody this morning. Good morning, Peening family. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Lori. Most likely, Riley as well. Good morning, Riley. Good morning, Sean and Catherine Doyle. And good morning, Peyton. And the Gallo clan. Good morning, Ivano. Good morning, Christina. Good morning, Chiara. Good morning, Dante. And good morning, Bianca. Glad you guys are here with us as well. And who else we got here? The Todds. How you doing, Todd family? Hmm? Just say it. Doing all right. Very good. <laughs> Very good. And we got an empty set of seats there, there, and there. But they have names on them, so they should be coming in soon enough, right? We are nine minutes early. See? See how church gets started way earlier now, saying hello to everybody and everything? Right? Brother Ted Cossett, good morning to you. Your chair is right up here, front and center. <laughs> this is a new fad, though, right? Pointing everybody out as they walk in. I know how much people love that. <laughs> Good morning, Roland and Madeline Cuthbert. Glad you guys are here. God bless you. Good morning, Susie McDonald. Glad you are here, and hopefully Lydia is here as well. Good morning to you, Lydia. Reg and Linda Stiff say, Shalom, brothers and sisters. We love you, and we respond to them that we love them in return, right? Amen. Amen. And we got uh, Bill and Judy, Brother Bill and Judy McLeod back there. How are you? Good to see you. You are always the picture of, you know, what's the good word to use? Because uh, sartorial is with uh, Brother Bill Blaney. Elegance is Miss Kathy. I got to figure out another word. Hmm? Excellence. That's right. See, and Brother Ted, it's stateliness, right? <laughs> <laughs> See, all sorts of good words. Good morning to you guys. Good morning, Ray and Lorraine. Glad you guys are here. God bless you. Oh, yes. <laughs> See it? All right, he is flashing me the love signs here. That's good stuff. Amen. Chuck and Diane Hamilton, glad you guys are here. God bless. Pardon? Oh. <laughs> oh, we got a few here. Helga Lacqua says good morning to everybody. Give her a big hug from on this side of the camera. That's right, Helga, you got some hugs here for you. Winston Neal, blessings to you and the peace of God in Christ to you too. Sing loud this morning because I am sure we can hear you through the camera, Brother Winston. That'll be great. Tom Kerber. Glad you are here, Tom, Monica, glad you guys are here, amen and amen, God bless you. J. Blake Williams says hello, good morning church from the Williams clan, good morning Williams family. And all the way in the back, we got the Goulds, how you doing Bill? How you doing Marg? Good morning, good morning, good morning. pardon? Pardon? Good morning. And entering into the arena. <laughs> Lynn Ann, good morning, Lynn Ann. <laughs> good morning, Brother Chuck. How are you? Good. You can't walk through. You, <laughs> you got to walk, yeah, up and then. No, Brother Bill. All right, come on. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Galleys, how are you doing, Iman and Emil? Fantastic. Glad you guys are here. Let's see. King Timex says hello. That is our brother Bill Bankner. Double B is here. Good morning to you, brother. Mike Bouzier says good morning. Good morning to everybody. Good morning to you, brother. Good morning, uh, Monica. Vasanthi, Nigel, Asher, good morning to you. Glad you guys are here. David and Rebecca Ronald, good morning to you. Uh, we are glad that you are here as well. It is wonderful to have you all here. Good morning, Elijah. Good morning, Trinity. Glad you are here with us. Hopefully they're waving, right? Good morning, good morning. And up in the balcony, 
Good morning, Allison. Good morning. Good morning, Allison. Brother Bill Blaney, good morning to you. You see how you got like entire sections to yourself up there, right? right? It used to be that you had, when you were sleeping, when people slept during a sermon, they had to sit like this. Now you could just let yourself go down, right? <laughs> There's like 11 chairs for you to stretch out on, right? <laughs> the Vanderkoys say hello. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Amy. Good morning, Isaiah. Good morning, Jacob. Is that Susanna going up there? Good morning, Susanna. <laughs> good morning, good morning. Man, did we turn off all the AC in here? It's hot. Is anyone else hot? Yeah. Where are my uh, little remotes here so I can turn these ones down? Randy Harris, good morning to you. Good morning to you. Glad you are here. Monique, good morning to you. Catherine and Elizabeth, good morning to you. So how's everybody doing? Everybody doing all right? Hey, Patricia. How are you? <laughs> no, you're three minutes early. But, you know, nowadays the new routine is that I call everybody out as they're coming into the sanctuary, right? Herb said that you like being up on the balcony, but uh, I put you right front right up front, right? <laughs> no problem, <laughs> no problem. My wife is back there, good morning to you, and Audrey, <laughs> good morning, Audrey, yeah, getting the wave, and Brother Bill Puttycomb taking attendance back there, thank you for your diligence. He emails me now in the morning and says, I'll be there to ensure that this is all well taken care of, and it makes me happy, I'm very thankful. Good morning, Robert Puttycomb. I hope you guys had a wonderful, how long has it been? Since, have they been back this whole week? When did they get back from vacation? Last, week. last, last Saturday. Well, I hope that he, you had a, a wonderfully relaxing holiday. The Ravensburgens are here. It's a good morning, not from the whole family, just from Nolan. That's what it says. Morning from Nolan. Well, I'm going to say hi to the entire Ravensbergen family. They figured out a way to get their actual name on here, which is great. So good morning, Chris. Good morning, Marie. Good morning, Nolan. Good morning, Evan. Glad you guys are here. Glad you guys are here. Man, you're all so quiet. Remember, you know, you guys can talk. You got masks on, you know? You can sing, too, as long as you have the mask on. You know, if you're going to sing, don't pull the mask down, right? That defeats the purpose of the mask. If you're going to sing, keep it up on your face, all right? Somebody bring me the remotes for these things. I don't even wear a mask in my glasses. are starting to fog up back here, up here. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, it's because of the three-piece? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> There should be two of them. There's an old one and a new one. There you go. Thank you. The Rodriguez clan is here. Good morning, Rodriguez clan. Good morning, Augusto. Good morning, Miriam. Good morning, Augusto Jr. And good morning, Daniel. Glad you guys are here. All right. Anyone else going to come in down at the wire? Oh, Wendy and Katie Merling are coming in at the wire. Good morning. Good morning. I just need these ones right here. I just need these ones. Oh, you'll do all of them, yeah. Cheryl, what's going on, Cheryl Sinisak? Glad you are here. Man, every week, yeah, put it down as low as it can go. If you can get it to one, put it to one. Oh, it only goes to 18? I'll settle for 18, I guess. <laughs> Yeckley clan, the Yeckley clan is here. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Jenny. Good morning, Levi. Good morning, Eden, and good morning, Nara. We are so glad that you are here. All right, Brother Rob, Pastor Rob has turned up, turned down. What's the appropriate way to, do we turn up the air conditioning or turn it down? We turn down the, we turn down the temperature, up the power on the air conditioner. All right, yeah. I remember being a kid and we used to say, hey, can you, uh, lower lower up the TV. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Doesn't make any sense. 
Carrie says hello, Cheryl. And the Harringtons, the Harringtons who are on vacation, have tuned in to worship along with us. We love you, Harringtons. We're so glad that you love us. Good morning, Brother Paul. Good morning, Megan. Good morning, Abel, Isaac, Silas, Marley. We are so glad you guys are here as well. And we are here this morning to do the greatest thing that we can do, which is worship our wonderful Lord together. He is great. He is awesome. He is wonderful. There is nothing more joy-bringing and delightful than to sing his praises and to sit under the teaching of his word together. And so I am so glad that you are all here. And what we usually like to do is read some scripture <clears throat> to kind of, <coughs> kind of give you a... Uh, I just swallowed down the wrong tube. That's why I'm coughing. <coughs> to kind of center us a little bit. I know that uh, life can be hectic. Life can, life can be crazy. And so we need to just kind of hear God's word, spend a little bit of time just making sure that um, there's nothing blocking our uh, time of fellowship with him this morning. And so uh, I'm going to read some of, of God's word and then We'll just take some time to silently pray. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. <clears throat> In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy." My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Let's pray. Amen. Would you please stand with us as we sing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
join me in a word of prayer this morning. Uh, Father, we praise you for your goodness, your kindness, your love for us. We know that you have created the world and everything in it, and you created man as the pinnacle, as the, as the highlight of your creation. Yet man has rebelled against you, and sin entered the world, and death through sin. Yet you have loved us so much that you sent Jesus Christ into the world to redeem sinners, to reconcile us back to you, to restore the fellowship that was broken in the garden. And we praise you that this fellowship that we now have with you, this common salvation is greatly displayed in your church as we fellowship together as saints, showing that our fellowship with you has been restored. So as we gather here this morning as your people, uh, we come to worship you in spirit and in truth. Would you continue to show us more of Jesus Christ? Help us to love each other. Help us to pray for one another, to help each other, to encourage each other during these difficult and uncertain times that that love may be displayed and your love in us is, would be evident to all. And we pray for the preaching of your word. We thank you for your holy and living word. May you plant it deep down into our hearts and grow us into be more like Jesus Christ. Help us to be more than people who just come to church, more, more than people just come to hear your word, but help us to be people who proclaim and speak your word to those who don't know, who don't know you yet. We pray for the message this morning, that you would give us attentiveness, you would give us listening ears, and you will help us to know you more than we have known you um, at this time. May you be honored and glorified in all that we do. And um, I also want to just lift up the youth uh, group of Winona Gospel Church. And as we look forward to meeting this Tuesday for the first time in months, would you um, continue to pray for the leaders, that the leaders would um, glorify you and honor you and serve you as, as they serve the youth here and pray for the ministry that it would continue to grow and that the, the people that attend would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and would live their lives um, for your honor and your name. Um, and I just pray for the service that be a pleasing and acceptable worship to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you feel so led, would you please stand with us? And we're going to sing, His Mercy is More.
All right, go ahead and open your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We are continuing our look at the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. We will read Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 6 this morning. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. And if you are so ready, able, willing, and inclined, would you please stand with me for the reading of God's holy, inspired, inerrant, and sufficient word this morning. Seeing the crowds, he, that's Jesus, went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. This is the word of the Lord this morning. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Have you ever been really, truly desperate? Maybe you were, as a parent, you had one time you thought that your children were lost. You remember that moment, right? You thought your child is gone. You don't know where they are. And so every ounce of your energy, effort, and attention is focused on finding your child. Or perhaps you were the child and you were the one who was lost. And you remember that desperation that you felt. Where is my mom? Where is my dad? I got to find them. And every ounce of your energy and effort went into trying to find your parents. <clears throat> or perhaps you've gone on a long trip, <clears throat> not taking into a consideration the distance between one gas station and another. And so as you are drinking copious amounts of water and pop and whatever else, coffee, all of a sudden you become desperate for a washroom. And all you can think about is getting to one. And you drive faster and you look. You ever felt that desperation? Scripture is overflowing with stories of desperate people. And I don't mean just, got to use the washroom desperate, I mean like really desperate people. In the Gospel of Mark, for example, we read of a woman who had been suffering for 12 years. Pastor Robert preached on her, about her a while ago. She had been suffering for 12 years with a discharge of blood, a discharge that, according to Levitical law, made her unclean. And the fact that she was unclean meant that she could not participate in temple worship. And in her desperate desire to be healed, she did the unthinkable. She pressed through the throngs of people following Jesus in hopes of simply touching her, his garment. And she thought to herself, if I can just touch his clothes, if I can just get my hands on his clothes, I will be made well. And had the crowd around her known of her affliction, had the crowd realized who this was that was touching all of them as she went to get through the crowd to Jesus, they might have harmed her. They might have hurt her. They might have responded terribly towards her for her audacious act. But in her desperation, all she could focus on, all she could think of, all her energy was focused on getting to Jesus. We also read of Jairus, Jairus one of the rulers of the synagogue. Now, rulers of the synagogue were men that other men bowed to. I would venture to say that J Jairus likely never bowed to another human being in his life. But his daughter was sick. You ever have the desperation of a sick child? What would you do to ensure that your child gets better? This Jairus, seeing Jesus, fell at Jesus' feet, 
imploring him with every ounce of his being to come and lay hands on his daughter. Every other consideration in Jairus' life took a back seat to the desperation that he felt about his daughter. His desperate longing for Jesus to heal his daughter. We also read in that same chapter of a Syrophoenician woman, or in a later chapter, of a Syrophoenician woman. Her little daughter, her little daughter, had an unclean spirit. And so this woman, hearing that Jesus was passing through her town, came to him and fell down at his feet. Now, this is in violation of pretty much every Jewish religious tradition. In her desperation, she approached Jesus. And in this day, women didn't approach rabbis, much less Gentile women. But here she is, begging Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. And she persisted with him. And she was undeterred by his initial reply to her request. You remember it. Jesus said to her, Let the children be fed first. For it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And Jesus, impressed with her uh, persistence, impressed by her humility and her belief that Jesus had the power to heal her daughter, ended up doing just that. And this woman got home to find that her daughter had been healed. But in her desperation, all she could think about was getting to this Jesus who could possibly heal her daughter. Desperation leads a person to do anything and everything in their power to alleviate the condition they are desperate to solve. Desperation causes us to focus all of our energy and all of our attention and all of our concern on the issue at hand. And this morning, as we look at the fourth beatitude, Jesus reveals the desperate desire that is present in a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, saying... Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So a little bit of a recap. As we've been learning over the past few weeks, the preaching ministry of Jesus began and was centered on and focused on a very precise message. We see it in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. The first words of Jesus in his public ministry are, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And these words were a call, these words are a call for everyone who hears them to turn away from their sin and turn towards the Lord in faith. And this because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And for those who heard this call of Jesus, for those who believed what Jesus had said, for those who wanted to listen and, and heed the command that Jesus was giving, a secondary question might arise in their head. How can I know? How can I know if I've truly repented? How do I know if I have truly turned from sin and to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith? How can I know if my knee is truly bent in subjection to the king of the kingdom? Because it seems, doesn't it, in our day that there are so many who think that they have entered into the kingdom of God and yet do not live like or do not care to live like citizens of that kingdom. There are so many who claim to be citizens of the kingdom of God who are content to burn their own flag, who are content to tout and exalt values that are contrary to the kingdom that they profess to be a part of. And so how can we know? So Jesus will answer this question in these eight Beatitudes. Here we see eight kingdom qualities or eight kingdom virtues that are present in those or that characterize those who truly believe in Christ, who've truly repented and turned to Him in faith. These Beatitudes are not, and I keep reiterating this, they are not 
contrary to the popular belief, an introduction to eight separate groups of people who are blessed by the Lord because they find themselves in some sort of burdensome situation. Some sort of situation like poverty or grief or mourning. No, these statements describe one group of people, the citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus began this description of the, the kingdom citizen by saying in Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the truly repentant, according to Jesus here, is the one who is poor in spirit. Poor in spirit means that they recognize their poverty before the Lord. They grasp their destitution. They grasp the reality that they lack any righteousness in God's sight. The poor in spirit are those who understand that I have nothing in my hands to offer God that could appease Him or turn His favor in my direction. The poor in spirit are therefore blessed because they possess no delusions about any inherent goodness. They simply throw themselves at the feet of Jesus, pleading and praying for salvation, pleading and praying for forgiveness and for grace and for mercy. And do you know what happens when we do, so, when we do this? We receive it. We receive his mercy. We receive his grace. We receive his forgiveness. Oh, blessed ones are the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit know that none are good enough, that none are righteous enough to measure up to or live up to God's perfect standard of holiness. And it's these who are blessed, these who recognize their situation and their standing before the Lord and who turn to Him and plead for forgiveness. It is these that Jesus says are blessed. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Meaning they are saved by the grace of God through faith in the king. And Jesus continues and he describes number two, the second quality or virtue of the kingdom citizen, saying in Matthew 5 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. See, the truly, uh, the truly repentant are those who mourn over their sinful and wicked deeds. The mourners are those who, when confronted by the perfect holiness of God, and how far short we fall of that perfect holiness of God, mourn about it and grieve over it. Jesus says, it is these, the mourners, who shall be comforted. You see that? These shall be comforted. And how? How, you might ask? By the gospel of the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we mourn over our sin and we look to God's word for comfort, we realize and are comforted by the lengths that God went to in order to deal with our sin. God himself took on flesh and made his dwelling among us. God himself, in living among us, lived the perfect life that none of us could live. And he applies that perfect righteous life to anyone, to all who believe in him. And he went to the cross to pay sin's penalty in our place. Jesus took on himself the wrath that I deserve, the wrath that you deserve. Jesus fully and finally dealt with the consequences of sin in and for all who believe. And we are comforted as we mourn over our sin by the wonders of a Savior who delivers us from it. We are comforted as we mourn over our sin by the promise of God's word that his grace is greater than that sin. And in the third beatitude that we looked at last week, Jesus revealed that in the kingdom citizen there is also a change in their disposition. Saying in Matthew 5, 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You see, whereas the citizen of the world uses every ounce of their power for the advancement of self, whether it is in the satisfaction of the flesh as we seek vengeance against someone who's harmed us, whether it's the usage of our power in order to step on and advance past another person or to hold someone else down so that we, could, we can get uh, advanced, the meek, <clears throat> the citizens of the kingdom, are those who do not use their power to hold others back or to seek vengeance upon others. The meek are those who, though they have it in their power to act, use that power for the good of other people. The meek 
are those who are not easily provoked to anger. The meek are those who, while I said, like I said, it is in their power to act. It is in their power to lash out. It is in their power to seek vengeance. It is in their power to get angry. They use that power instead to seek the good of others, leaving any vengeance and any repayment in the hands of the Lord. Why? Because the Lord is the only one who truly judges justly. The meek refuse to pay evil with evil, but use their power to repay evil with good. The meek refuse to stoke the fires of bitterness and strife. The meek will bear almost anything, refusing to hold on to any resentment with another person, because to do so is to use your power against them for evil. The meek use what power they have for other people, not against other people. The meek refuse to bear grudges, grudges, but instead labor to imitate our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus is the one who had all authority and all power on heaven, in heaven and on earth. And how did Jesus use that power? He used it to secure forgiveness and deliverance for any who believe. <clears throat> it is these, the meek, that Jesus said will inherit the earth. And that's contrary to the world's understanding, right? The world's expectation is that the powerful will overtake the world. But here, Christ declares a wonderful truth. It is the subjects of his kingdom, the citizens of his kingdom, who will be given the earth. And now, <clears throat> Jesus discloses a fourth quality of the truly repentant kingdom citizen saying in chapter 5, verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. See, submission to the king, bowing the knee to the king, leads to a change in our focus as we live life here. It leads to a new desperation in us. <clears throat> we become fixated upon and desperate for righteousness. Whereas righteousness was never a consideration in our lives before, it now becomes our all-encompassing passion. Anyone who professes faith in Jesus Christ but does not concern themselves with the pursuit of righteousness is merely fooling themselves. And so the question then is given to you, is righteousness your aim? Are you desperate? Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Now, I'm not going to say that this is easy because it's not. Hungering and thirsting after righteousness is very difficult. Why? Because there's something wrong with us. There is something wrong with each and every one of us. Humanity suffers from a rather serious dysfunction. Blaise Pascal, the great 17th century theologian, described our dysfunction in this way, saying... Man's sensitivity to little things and insensitivity to the greatest things are marks of a strange disorder. Man's sensitivity to little things and insensitivity to the greatest things are marks of a very strange disorder. The idea being that we will invest so much of our time, so much of our energy, so much of our resources into increasing our worldly pleasures, that which Blaise Pascal says are the little things. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones commented that we live in a society and we are a people committed to pleasure mania. Pleasure mania. And we see it everywhere, right? The great mass of humanity dedicates the lion's share of its zeal towards the attainment of comforts in this life. And we will labor to remove any obstacle that gets in the way of those comforts, won't we? If something gets in the way of our pleasure, we will marshal all of our ingenuity, all of our wit, all of our capabilities, all of our enthusiasm to pulverize any and all barriers to our pleasure. However, this enthusiasm, this zeal, this energy, this fire, this passion, it always seems to just dissipate or disappear when we are called on to strive for the greater and more important things like righteousness, holiness, wisdom in the Lord, doesn't it? 
And this for Pascal, for Blaise Pascal, was the mark of a great and strange disorder in humanity. That we invest so much capital into the trivial while complaining and moaning and, and outright ignoring the significant, the urgent, and the critical. There was a Puritan pastor named Jeremiah Burroughs. He observed this tendency and addressed it in a book that, uh, that was made up of sermons to his congregation. And he wrote, now I've abridged it a little bit because <clears throat> the English is from the 1600s, so I've changed it to make it a little easier to understand. He said, Let a person be busied with or engaged in earthly things from which they gain some earthly advantage, some earthly profit, some earthly pleasure, then no difficulties or obstacles will hinder them. No strong winds or terrible weather will stop them. That person will rise on cold mornings and travel anywhere in the world. Oh, the difficulties that we, they will endure for advantage and or profit. They will brave storms, hazards at sea, hazards on land. They will sit up late. They will rise early in the morning. They'll toil and labor without complaint, without weariness or difficulty. But let that same person bring themselves to spiritual matters, to soul business that concerns God and their spiritual position before him, then every little difficulty puts them aside. Every little difficulty discourages them. Every anthill is a mountain in their way, some insurmountable obstacle in their path. I would read God's word, they say, but it's too hard. I would get up in the morning to be spiritual, but I'm just too tired. It's difficult to read. It's difficult to pray. And while they will expend any amount of energy in their worldly pursuits, they complain about the difficulties in their spiritual pursuits. God's will is tiresome to a carnal heart. So in other words, to recap again, people work hard. People labor with all of their might to achieve their highest levels of comfort and enjoyment in, their, in this life. We will go to the greatest of lengths. We will stay up late. We will get up early. We will work long hours. We will put every ounce of effort needed to get ahead in this world. And if obstacles arise, we will do all we can to remove them. Why? Because we hunger and we thirst for pleasure. We hunger and we thirst for ease. We hunger and we thirst for comfort. But can we say the same thing when it comes to our spiritual pursuits? Look at what Jesus said again. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. The idea here being that there will be a switch in what we hunger and thirst after. The kingdom citizen will have a new goal, a new principle, a new guiding focus in their life, which is righteousness. The truly repentant will make righteousness a priority. They will make it a priority to know whether or not we have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ and will, as a result, strive to grow in righteous living, righteous in word, righteous in thought, and righteous in deed. And so Jesus will use this everyday language of hunger and thirst to illustrate this kingdom quality. Blessed are those who hunger and who thirst for righteousness. Now, you need to know, this is not language that's describing some sort of small hunger pang in our stomach. This is not some language of light thirst, but this is the language of desperation. The pursuit of righteousness, the desire for righteousness, is not some simple add-on to our already full lives. No, for the kingdom citizen, striving for righteousness is an all-encompassing passion. Have you ever been truly desperate for something to the point that your entire life is focused on that something? For many in the world, it actually is hunger and thirst. Hunger and thirst characterize their existence because they're, they are desperate for food and water because both food and water are scarce. Jesus is not describing the hunger growls of a people with stocked fridges, or the slight dehydration of those who can simply turn on their taps for water. He is describing those for whom their entire lives are focused on getting food or water because without it, they cannot survive. But even so, 
Think about your own life. Have you ever been really thirsty? Like maybe not to the point of death, but really thirsty. I mean thirsty to the point where all you could think of was, I need some water. And then your mind, right, it becomes completely focused on finding a tap. It becomes completely focused on finding a water fountain somewhere. You ever been really, really, really hungry? To the point where all you could think about was getting something in your stomach? You ever, you, I mean, we don't really get hungry here. But when we do feel those pains, have you ever noticed the lengths that you will go to to get some food in your stomach? And the things you will do and how your mind, it, it, the entirety of your actions flow in the direction of the appeasement of that craving? In like manner, to hunger and thirst for righteousness means to desperately desire it. To concentrate all of our efforts on this one thing. To hunger and thirst for righteousness means recognizing that we must move from a state of rottenness to righteousness and then setting righteousness before us as our driving pursuit because we want nothing more in this life than to honor, to obey, and to glorify the Lord who saved us. And did you see the promise that Christ made to those who strive for righteousness in the text? They will be satisfied. Now, why is that important? It's because there is a hunger and a thirst that have been implanted in the hearts of all of humanity by the Lord. Solomon wrote it in Ecclesiastes 3.11, right? The Lord has put eternity into man's heart. There is built into each and every one of us a thirst for things that are greater than ourselves. But humanity in its endless and boundless foolishness tends to suppress the knowledge of God in favor of trying to fill that hunger and fill that thirst with a number of worldly things. However, no matter what the world offers, no matter what earthly pleasure we attempt to fill this hunger and thirst with, the thirst remains. Everything we turn to on this earth to fill that thirst eventually disappoints. In fact, the Apostle John told us that it will all pass away. In 1 John 2, we read, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So all the pleasures and the passions of this world, they're all passing away. Nothing in this world can truly satisfy our real thirst because of it the world be passing away because the world is all temporary and as we live in this world we have to realize like we have to get it through our heads that every worldly thing we take pride in every worldly pleasure we engage in will eventually let us down and why is that why can't the world quench our thirst because we are created to be satisfied by the only one by only one God himself. God is the great joy of our souls. God is the great hunger appeaser. God is the great thirst quencher. And the great early church father Augustine recognized this quite early when he wrote these words, you, Lord, have made us for yourself, and our hearts remain restless until they rest in you. And this image of the Lord being the only one who can truly quench our deep spiritual thirst it's all over scripture. The imagery of water and thirst quenching is one that the Lord uses con constantly throughout scripture. This truth was constantly held out to Israel in the Old Testament because they also had the habit of suppressing the wonders of God revealed in his word, exchanging of his glory for the things of earth. And so the prophets used to cry out to the Israelites, that God is your great satisfaction. The same thing can be said today. God is our great satisfaction. He is the great joy of our souls. Obeying Him, imitating Him, loving Him, seeking His righteousness, far from robbing us of joy, is what increases our joy. 
And so the Lord cried out to Israel through the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 2. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves. Broken cisterns that can hold no water. You see that? Two sins in this text are committed. And these two sins, Jeremiah calls out, be appalled, be shocked by these sins. And what are the sins? First, that God's people forsake him, who is the fountain of living waters, the only one in existence who can truly quench spiritual thirst in favor of attempts to fill that thirst with earthly sins and earthly offerings. However, this world can never satisfy. This world and all of the sin in it are the equivalent of broken cisterns, cisterns that hold no water, absolutely no water, not even a single drop of refreshing water. It is a terrible, terrible trade. Apart from the Lord, we have no idea what promotes our joy. We have no idea what promotes and increases our comfort, which is why we see humans running after the same things over and over and over, even though they don't satisfy. It's played out as we watch, we, it's played out over and over again as we watch a world running with all of its vigor in the direction of the most destructive of sins. And self professed Christians running alongside of these people practicing these destructive sins and not, they, and, and not only taking part in them, but encouraging them. In those sins, be appalled, O heavens. Be shocked, O heavens. Broken cisterns have become the aim of your people. And this is the complete opposite of hungering and thirsting for righteousness. However, the Lord doesn't simply reveal the follies of humanity chasing after the salty sin that only serves to increase our thirst, but he also holds out the location of and calls us to the source of true joy, true life-giving water, true soul thirst quenching. Through the prophet Isaiah, he cried out, Come, everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters, he who has no money. Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. See, the Lord offers, the Lord holds out the life-giving waters that qu truly quench the deep thirsts of the soul. The Lord offers the food that satisfies our deep spiritual hunger. And the psalmist will continually use this imagery of thirsting after the Lord in recognition that he is the only one who satisfies. And their desperate desire to obey his life-giving word as they pursue righteousness. The sons of Korah in Psalm 42 wrote this, as, the, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so my so pants my soul for you. Oh God, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And King David as well wrote, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. And again, David writes in Psalm 143, I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. So again, you see, this is no small thirst, but the thirst that arises from dwelling in a dry and weary land that is starving from water. It is a thirst that arises when traveling through a parched land. And that's exactly what this world without the Lord is. A consistent mirage of water that never quenches and never satisfies. And as we move close or attain the world's fool's water, it never satisfies. And Jesus here makes a promise. He pronounces a blessing on those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. He says, it is they who shall be satisfied. Don't fool yourself into thinking that the world can ever satisfy. You want to know who will be satisfied? 
those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. True satisfaction is gained when you hunger and thirst after righteousness. So what is this righteousness that we are blessed to hunger and thirst after? First, it is righteousness in God's sight. And second, it is the result of true righteousness before God, which is a striving to live righteously on earth. So there are two dimensions, right? Actually being saved and made righteous in the sight of the Lord, and then living out that righteousness in ever-increasing measure while we are here on earth. And just yesterday, I was having a conversation with someone about this very subject. See, this is one of the good things about preaching, right? You're thinking about a text, you start talking with people about it, and you just go to town. It's great. I was talking with someone about righteousness before the Lord. And I, I always have to remind myself, right, that people do not know how to be saved. People do not know how to be made right with the Lord. So just as you're out there ministering to people in the world, never assume that anyone that you're talking to knows how to be saved. Nobody on their own figures out that we are saved by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. And so I asked this person, I said, uh, do you know how to move from the position of rottenness before the Lord to perfect righteousness? Do you know how to do that? Is that something that you would want? And he gave me the same answer that everybody gives. I try to do good things, so I think that's how it happens. And so when I hear that, we're going into it. We're going to have a talk here. So I said to him, you know, you need to listen, you need to understand your spiritual bank account. Your spiritual bank account stands at negative infinity. Like if the Lord is the great banker and he's looking at you and you are a bank account, you are standing at negative infinity. So how do you move from negative infinity? How do you pay that debt so that you can actually, you know, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect? That's what Jesus said. Jesus said you have to be perfect, but here you stand with this humongous unpayable debt. I said, Jesus told us that our righteousness or our good deeds must exceed that of the Pharisees. And I said, do you know who the Pharisees were? They were the religious leaders of the day, most meticulously committed to observing every single tiny little letter of the law. How dedicated are you, I said, to following the letter of God's word? And this person started to grasp their position a little bit. He said, I guess, I guess I can't. So what hope does that leave anyone? Oh, yeah, and there I hear that question. I'm like, all right, let's go into that one. I said, there is a hope. There is one hope. And listen, by believing in and trusting in that hope, you will be made righteous in the sight of God. By trusting in Jesus, who is God, come in the flesh to deal with and take away the sins of the world, a couple of, couple of unbelievably wonderful occurrences will take place in you and in your standing before the Lord should you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, Jesus did everything necessary to alleviate the state of your spiritual bank account. Jesus went to the cross and there died in your place, taking on himself the repercussions for your sin, which are God's anger and God's justice. Jesus paid the price that you ought to pay, which is an eternity experiencing the just retribution of God against you and your wicked sin. However, if you believe in Jesus, he took on himself that divine retribution, meaning that the negative infinity of your bank account is paid off and you're brought to zero. Jesus paid the debt that you owe on the cross. So that's a pretty big move, right? You've gone from rotten to neutral. But that's not all. If it stops there, you're forgiven, but not righteous. You have a zero, in, a zero balance, but what you need is a plus infinity balance. And so how do you get that? From the same wonderful person, Jesus Christ. He lived the perfect righteous life that God requires. Jesus never sinned. Jesus never fell short. He never disobeyed the Father. In fact, the number of times that the Father speaks from heaven about the Son, he always says things like, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And for all who trust in Jesus, 
The perfect life of Jesus is credited to your bank account, your spiritual bank account. And those same words are spoken of us. For those of us in Christ who have been given the righteousness of Christ, when the Father speaks of you, he says, this is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. So by the grace of God, through faith in the Son, your spiritual debt is paid in full and his righteous life is credited to your account and you are transferred from the domain of darkness into the marvelous light of his Son. You are no longer a child of the devil, but instead adopted into the family of God as his very own Son. So, that was a pretty intense conversation. And it's these who hunger and thirst for the righteousness of Christ, these and these alone, of all the people on the earth who will truly be satisfied. I said, you keep looking for satisfaction in things that can't satisfy. Scripture tells us that it is the righteousness of God that truly satisfies. And it's available to you in Jesus, who made this abundantly clear when he cried out on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles these words, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Meaning, if you are tired of the unfulfilled promises of the world, if you are tired of the unfulfilled returns of sin, you are told the unreturned... Sin, the unreturned promises of sin that you are told will satisfy the deepest desires of your soul. If you're tired of all of that, Jesus says, I will satisfy your thirst. I'm the only one who can satisfy your thirst because you were created for more than this world can offer, which is why the world can never truly gratify you. So, this righteousness is striving for righteousness in God's sight. And for the one who does come to the saving knowledge of Christ in faith, there will be an ever-increasing hunger and an ever-increasing thirst to actually live out this righteous status on earth. As we hunger to be rid of our sin, as we thirst to live in obedience to the Lord, in conformity to his commands, the truly righteous are those who are desperate to grow in spiritual maturity and Christ-likeness. Now, we just have to be honest about this, right? Let's be honest about this desire. It is more often than not, if you're anything like me, this is confession time from me to you, a frustrated desire. This is a universal experience, so it is me confessing to you, but it's also me exposing you. (laughs) It is the universal experience of believers across all times and all places. That of a consistent battle against that of a consistent all-out war with, and frustration, irritation, and vexation with the sin that we so often give into. It's so difficult to win this battle, isn't it? And yet, and if you're anything like me, you fail so often. I hunger for righteousness. You hunger for righteousness. You thirst for righteousness. You want to obey the Lord. And yet, you and I continue to fall prey to our sinful tendencies. None who thirst for righteousness, none who are hungry for righteousness want this to be the case. We don't want to be consistently assailed by the sins that persist in us. We are agitated by and we are annoyed by those sins that consistently get to us. The devil knows what he can tempt us with. And he uses that range of sins. He knows exactly the ones to put in front of you. He knows exactly the ones to bring to your mind. And so here we are, frustrated by our sins of anger, frustrated by our lazinesses, our lusts, our high and prideful and arrogant minds, our lack of self-control, our mental battles against unwanted desires, our battles with unforgiveness and bitterness, along with a host of other sins. Here we all are, battling these things. We know deep down that these are all sins and we hate them. And I can honestly say that I am consistently frustrated by my sinful tendencies and my sinful habits. I despise the numerous imperfections in myself and yet I continue to give in to them over and over and over again. Am I alone? I know what I want to be. You know what you want to be. 
We want to be so much like Christ, right? We want to be so much like Christ that people see him so clearly in us. And yet, if people look close enough at me, people look close enough at you, all they see is some poor sinner battling against his own flesh. I want to live, and I know that if you love Jesus, you want to live an unassailably righteous life. And yet, our battle with the, we battle with the simplest of sins. And this is the experience that we all face. This is the experience that we all endure. We all hunger for righteousness. True believers do. And yet all find ourselves consistently irritated by our inability to live up to the righteous hopes, lives we hope to live. The Apostle Paul was also frustrated by this reality. The Apostle Paul was also frustrated by his battle against sin in his own life. Paul who was a man who hungered and thirst for righteousness. He was a man who hungered for Christ's honor and Christ's glory. He's a man who devoted the entirety of his life to bringing the truth of the gospel to the world. The same man who penned by the working of the Holy Spirit a number of letters in the New Testament. This man was engaged in the same battle for righteousness that you are and that I am and found himself also consistently frustrated in his efforts as we are, and he wrote about it, saying, I am of the flesh, sold under sin, for I do not understand my own actions. I do not, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. That's frustration, right? And isn't that your experience? It's mine. You know what you want. I know what I want. I want to live for Jesus. I want to live in obedience to Jesus in every area of my life because he gave up his life to save mine. He gave up his life to save yours. And you and I want to honor him with our lives and yet we end up doing what we tried to avoid rather than what we wanted to do. And hear Paul, hear Paul, I do not understand my own actions. And he goes on to say, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Now, this is not Paul resigning to some, to this fact. The idea here is, I have been made holy and righteous in the sight of God, and yet sin still trespasses within me. There is still some corruption in me, in my being, that I am still vulnerable to and persuaded by. And Paul calls this the corruption of the flesh. And Paul would later explain this in Galatians when he said, the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So here it is. There is a part in each one of us, the flesh, scripture calls it, that remains unredeemed in us at this moment. And when our bodies are renewed and when our bodies are perfected and combined with our renewed and perfected souls, this flesh will be no more. This inner corruption will be no more. But for now, Scripture calls upon us who hunger and thirst after righteousness to continue in the battle for righteousness, to continue in our desperation for righteousness. Scripture tells us make no provision for this flesh. Even though the battle is difficult, even though we lose, sometimes over and over and over and over again, we are called to keep fighting. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness is therefore coming to Christ for salvation, recognizing that you are made completely righteous with God by grace through faith in Jesus, who is the living water that quenches our souls, who is the only one able to satisfy the thirst in our souls, and then laboring with everything you have and are by the power of the Spirit who lives in you to defeat the corruption that still remains in you. Warring against, the, the, the corruption that is warring against the Spirit in us. This war is the outworking of this new internal reality. A hunger and a thirst for righteousness. The citizen of the kingdom does not engage, or the, the, the non-citizen of the kingdom, the citizen of the world does not engage in this battle. The righteous, however, make war against the flesh in pursuit of righteousness. And this for the Apostle Paul is a constant command given to those who have come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. So for example, in Galatians he says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh 
with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. In his letter to the Colossians, Paul reminded the Colossian believers of their new life in Christ and as a result of that new reality that they now are alive in Christ, he issued this command, put to death therefore what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness which is idolatry. On account of these the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must Put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. But not only are we called to put things to death in Colossians 3 from the, from the command of Paul here, but we are also called to strive to put on so put to death what is earthly and put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. In other words, strive, hunger and thirst after righteousness. And the Apostle Peter also, writing to believers, he told them, his, that's the Lord's, divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So you see that? When you come to the saving knowledge of Christ, when you are moved from rottenness to righteousness, there is this divine power that is granted to the believer so that we can engage in this battle. And as a result of this divine power given to us to engage in this battle, the Apostle Peter writes this, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never f fall. Be diligent in your pursuit of. Be desperate in your striving for, your hunger and thirst for righteousness. And listen, you and I in our pursuit, you and I in this battle, you and I engaging in this fight will mess up. There will be moments when we don't understand why we do what we do. Why it ends up being the evil that we didn't want to do rather than the good that we wanted to do that comes to pass. And it's in this, these moments that you should remember the same wonderful truth Paul did in that text when he said, Wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? His answer, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus saves run to Christ, plead for forgiveness, confident in the fact that if we, for, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive and get back to striving for righteousness. When you fall, run to Christ, get up, keep fighting. Don't allow yourself to leave off the learning of God's word or prayer or the pursuit of holiness. Let righteousness be what you are desperate for. Let righteousness be what you strive for. Let righteousness be your great passion. Let righteousness be what you hunger and thirst for. Let, it be, let your efforts for righteousness be greater than anything that you go through to, for worldly gain. Greater than any of the efforts you would put into anything else. Let your desperation for your hunger and your thirst for righteousness be the guiding principle of your life because jesus said blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they shall be satisfied father we love you we praise you we thank you we praise you for the righteousness that is given to us who believe in the lord jesus christ we thank you for his work on our spiritual bank accounts, paying the debt and then crediting to our account the righteousness that we so desperately require. We thank you that in Christ we move from rotten to righteous. 
And so, Lord, I pray for all of us who have come to the saving knowledge of Jesus that you would instill in us a desperate passion for righteousness, a deep and abiding hunger and thirst for righteousness. Let our lives continually be, grow to, to, in, in their imitation of Jesus. That's, all, that's what we desperately want. And I pray that you would not allow the enemy to kick us when we're down. I pray that you would not allow the enemy to use our times of when we fall and when we mess up to uh, keep us from coming to you. It's one of his great uh, techniques and strategies. And we ask that you would reveal to us in ever-increasing measure that our true satisfaction comes not from avoiding you, but from running to you in repentance and then getting back on the road to, uh, in the battle for uh, righteousness. We praise you, we love you, and we thank you for everything you've accomplished for us in our Lord Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand with us as we sing our closing song, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me.
Now you all have an aid in this battle for righteousness. The Apostle Paul gives us a word of comfort and a word of joyous celebration in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 when he says, Now the Lord is spirit, is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. In your battle against your flesh and corruption, you have the Spirit, and He never fails. So keep fighting, keep hungering, keep thirsting. God is good. Amen and amen. I love you. We'll see you all next week. God bless you.